Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Josie Chen, I'm from NIST, and today I'm going to talk, to talk to you about um, how we characterize the ion energy um, after the sideband cooling in our um, ion clock. Okay, so in the first slide, I just list some of the um, properties of the aluminum ion. Aluminum ion, it has its own advantage and also has its own challenge. Um, compared to other, um, well, optical frequency reference, um, aluminum ion has the smallest black body radiation or radiation dependence, which make easy to uh, many applications. However, aluminum ion has its own challenge. The largest challenge is because it's small mass. Um, compared to other ions, because it has smaller mass, so with given same amount of energy, you can imagine it will move faster, which means you have larger Doppler shifts. Um, so here I just list um, two dominant uncertainties that we report a couple years ago. And these two are related to the, these two, these two uncertainties relate to the um, Doppler effect. And the first one is from the excess micromotion. Um, usually this excess micromotion can be reduced significantly by well design of the trap geometry or uh, better calibration. Um, the second one, the secular motion, and which is the, uh, the residual energy that ion have when it's trapped in the harmonic well. And in this talk, I will tell you about how we uh, reduce the secular motion time dilation shift uncertainties. And in the literature, it has been mentioned many times that people can uh, apply uh, or maybe just implement the ground state cooling uh, to reduce the secular motion shift. But as far as we know, um, this has been, this has not been implemented due to the complexity of the laser system and also other uh, technical challenges. Okay. So before digging in all the details, I would like to show you how our trap looks like. Um, our trap system basically is a 300 micron uh, diamond wafer laser machined and the gold sputter electrode. And this is a uh, linear pole trap. So in this picture, we zoom into the center of the trap and we drive differentially on this 4-IF electrode using our Mianderlein resonator. And in this picture, you can see these two end cap that we apply DC to provide the actual confinement. Okay, so in our system, we trap the magnesium ion and aluminum ion in the same time in our trap. Um, the old clock operation condition, uh, operation procedure starts from a sympathetic cooling aluminum ion using the magnesium ion. And then we do the clock integration and in the, at, at the final step, we extract the clock transition probability using quantum logic spectroscopy. And here I just show you the uh, energy diagram of magnesium. And in our system, uh, we basically drive the Raman transition between three, minus three and two minus two back and forth to manipulate the motion of quanta. And also the three minus three is our bright state that we can collect the fluorescence uh, by drive the resonance transition from three minus three to the P3 half levels. And to cool, because we want to cool the, all the secular modes, so we, pre, we have two sets of uh, Raman being set up to generate momentum kick along the trap axis and also perpendicular to the trap axis. And in our convention, we call the Z is along the trap axis and X, Y are two orthogonal radial direction. And in these slides, I just show you the um, time dilational shift on all the motional modes of our two ion crystal. So you can see um, here, oops, the uh, for each direction, you have common mode and a stretch mode. And the largest uh, shift is from the, the, the stretch mode of the radial direction. This is just because aluminum ion tends to have larger amplitude in the radial direction. Also, um, because in the radial direction, we have the intrinsic micromotion. And previously, we usually run our clock while doing the uh, continuous Doppler cooling. And this all protocol has some disadvantage. Um, the first one, the 
ultimate temperature you can achieve is limited by your adapter limit. And also because you do the cooling during the clock interrogation, so you have additional light shifts. And the new approach we want to use is to, okay, so we do the ground state cooling, cool ion to the motional ground state, and stop the cooling, and turn on the clock interrogation. So we don't have additional light shifts. And, but the disadvantage is because you don't have the cooling during the clock interrogation, your ion will get hit up due to the uh, anomalous heating. And also another problem is, um, it's well known that after siphon cooling, usually you will not have the thermal distribution. So the problem is how can we characterize the energy of our ion? So, oops, that looks weird. All right, that's all right. So this is the transition probability of our siphon transitions. So we just interleave um, our siphon cooling pulses on all, the, all six motional modes. And this is, uh, so the ray represents the siphon transition after, uh, sorry, uh, the ray is the spectrum after siphon cooling, and blue is a spectrum taken after Doppler cooling. And you can see after our siphon cooling pulses, most of the ray siphon disappear, which means we successfully place our two ion crystal close to a three dimensional ground state. So, but the question is what's the energy of these modes? So we can just zoom in on one of the motion, motional modes, say Z comma mode here. And this is blue side band and this is red side band. Basically you see nothing in the red side band. But if we just look at it more carefully, there's some signal in the red side band in the level about 1%. And this 1% signal is we need to characterize to know the energy or the information we need to acquire from this transition. But this is, a big challenge because usually you don't have much signal to noise ratio there. And also you don't know population because it's non thermal. So to resolve this problem, uh, we developed a ray equation simulation to study the uh, sideband cooling process. Um, so I don't tell you all, the I, I will not tell you all the details, but one thing I would like to mention is for the heating, uh, we basically just follow this reference and then treat the heating as interaction with another uh, MBM reservoir. And various heating mechanisms have been studied in our system. Um, again, I will not tell you all the details, but I would like to point out there are two uh, main contributions in our system. Um, I will tell you about these two mechanisms in the following two slides. And these two mechanisms actually define the final temperature you can achieve in our system. So the first heating mechanism is basically the, due to the combination of spontaneous emission and also the ray siphon pulse, ray siphon cooling pulse. So the, the idea is um, once you turn on your cooling pulse, due to the finite detuning from the intermediate state, you have some chance that ion will uh, pump to the, uh, this is our dark state. And once ion in a dark state, your cooling pulse will actually add one more quanta back to your bright state. And this mechanism actually is, it is just proportional to the duration of your sideband cooling pulse. So it's more important for the modes with smaller lambda key parameters. And in our case, this is dominant um, heating mechanism for four, uh, for four uh, radio modes. And the second mechanism has been discussed in the literature, which is due to the operational coupling. So when you turn on the sideband cooling pulse, you have some chance. You drive the carrier transition. And so again, once ion has been placed to the dark state, your sideband cooling pulse become heating pulse. You add one more quanta to the specific emotional mode. And this is you can naively think in that um, if you have a smaller sector frequency, this contribution will be larger. In our case, this is an important contribution for the actual modes. Okay, now we have the model and we just want to test our model, see how good they are. And the way we did is we just compare to experimental data directly. And so in the left panel, these points are from the experimental data. 
And these three curves are the red sideband carrier and the blue sideband Rabi oscillation. And Sally curve are our no free parameter simulation results. In the right panel, this is just the simulated population. So let's see how it looks like. Oops, why this guy's missing? I have no idea what's going on, to be honest, because I can see something here. Sorry. All right. That's fine. But at least I hope I convince you that our model is agrees with our model data reasonably. Because this is basically just a simulation results. But this, you can see, you can follow the, uh, the change of all the oscillations. Um, let's try it again. Still not working. But basically, our simulation can follow the change of all. You can, ju you can just check all the uh, Rabi oscillation curve during the segment pose. But how we learn from our model, or how we use our model to estimate energy after segment cooling? Well, this is some of the picture actually. This is so, so this is just a, a simulated uh, Fox state distribution after the segment cooling. And one thing I would like to emphasize is in our case, after cyber cooling, we see a very long tail all the way to very high Fox states. And in the simulation, it shows this long tail contribute more than 50% of the kinetic energy. And, but one thing, one unfortunate thing is this population are very small. You, in this case, they are all, all below 10 to minus four, which means you are not able to see in the experiment. So what we do is we fit our simulation data to the double thermal distribution to find a temperature that can characterize this long tail and use this as our one of our energy estimate and then fit our ray sideband flop data to a double thermal distribution again. And this approach tend to overestimate the energy, but I think that should be all right because well we are looking at the uncertainty here. And so this is a busy plot here. So I show the ray sideband Rabi oscillation of all six motional modes. And the ray curve is from the double thermal distribution and the blade is from single thermal distribution fitting. And the magenta curve is the result of our simulation. And also in the index, I also show you the energy from different masses. And these green lines are the energy we energy uncertainty we quote, and the upper bound is from the 95% confidence interval of a double thermal distribution fitting. And we think this is a quite conservative approach to estimate the energy. Okay, now we know we can estimate the energy after cyber cooling. But for during the clock interrogation, we don't have additional cooling. So ion would heat up during the anomalous heating. So we also monitor the heating rate of our system. So we spent about a month just to look at the heating rate of six motion modes. And in short, for all the common mode, we have the heating rate about 10 quanta per second. And for the stretch mode, we have the about one to two quanta per second. Then you can calculate the energy of any of, the, of your ion chain and by just using this formula. And with this, we can estimate what is the second motion time direction shift and uncertainty we can expect in our aluminum ion clock. Here's the result. So the green line is the second motion time direction shift from our estimate. And the blue, sorry, and the blue area is the uncertainty estimate from the uh, two sigma measurement of the, our heating rate. And you can see in general, um, we can achieve around one times 10 to minus 19 uncertainty for a typical, say, 100 to 200 millisecond interrogation time. And even extending your interrogation time to, to two seconds, we are still at a low 
times 10 to minus 19 naval. And this is pretty promising. For comparison, I also show you the uh, clock uncertainty due to the secular motion, time dilation shift, and also the uh, cooling laser light shift uh, we report years ago. And here, uh, we can see that we think we can, uh, we can expect an order of magnitude reduction in the second order, sec secular motion time dilation shift uncertainty. Okay, to conclude, um, we successfully cooled the, all the motional modes of, of, of our two ion crystal to the motional ground state. And also using our ray equation simulation, we are able to estimate, uh, to give the upper bound of the ion energy. And also we think our, uh, this ray equation model can help design more efficient cooling side pulse. And also can apply to other um, ion clock system to help reduce the uh, secular motion time issue shift to improve the accuracy. And finally, I would like to thank my colleagues and also our support, uh, financial supports, NIST, ONR, and the DARPA. And we have two posters in this conference. Um, welcome to stop by to check for more details. Thank you. Uh, yes, generally more, power law will be more general, um, but uh, we didn't play with, we didn't play with the, 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 the uh, power load. Um, one of the reasons is um, we try to, because if you try to use a power load and then for different results actually, um, you might have different power and we try to just use some universal um, um, way to estimate energy on all the modes. And, but, but for this fitting, we did play a lot about the, to check we have enough statistics here. Um, so say for these uh, fittings, we also tried the bootstrapping methods to make sure the model is correct, reasonably correct to, to represent our, simulate, our result here. <laughs>